All right, we're going to continue our our study in the cults. You know the cults. They come uh, knocking at your door. Some of them do, anyway. Uh, we'll talk about them next week. We're going to talk about what we uh, we abbreviate the JWs, the Jehovah's Witnesses. We'll talk about them next week. But uh, today we're going to talk about the Mormons. Uh, you see them, right, in their white shirts and uh, their ties and their black pants. And uh, sometimes they're on foot, sometimes they're on a bicycle. They have their little, uh, their little uh, name tags on, on their white shirts. And uh, they're trying to win people to the beliefs of Mormonism. And it is a cult, C-U-L-T. Uh, they do not believe uh, what uh, the Bible teaches. They have their own version of things. And you're going to learn a little bit uh, about the Mormons because I'll guarantee you this summer you may encounter one or two. They're on the streets now that the weather's nice. I see them all the time over in the store uh, where my wife and I shop. We go over there on a Monday. They're there. They're, they're purchasing uh, for their little... Uh, this is their missions trip. The young people in the Mormon church have a responsibility to uh, spend a year evangelizing, their style of evangelizing. And so you may encounter them. You need to know what they believe, and you need to know what the Bible says. And so Brother Dave is going to share with us. Someone else will share with us about the JWs next week. Well, I want to begin, if we could, if you take your Bibles and go to Psalm 47. Psalm 47. I just want to look at this psalm briefly, uh, or read through this psalm before we get started. Psalm 47. Psalm of the sons of Korah. O oh, clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. For the Lord Most High is terrible, and He is a great King over all the earth. He shall subdue the people under us and the nations under our feet. He shall choose our inheritance for us, the excellency of Jacob, whom He loved. Selah. God is gone up with a shout, the Lord with the shout of a trumpet. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises unto our King. Sing praises for God is the King of all the earth. Sing ye praises with understanding. God reigneth over the heathen. God sitteth upon the throne of His holiness. The princes of the people are gathered together, even the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong unto God. He is greatly exalted. Just as we're coming in and, and looking at this cult, I just wanted, I, you know, I read this psalm this morning, and it was, it was good, kind of getting our focus on who gets the worship. He is God, right? He alone is God. Jehovah is God. There is no other God. He deserves the worship. He is in control. He deserves all praise. Amen. So, uh, just to kind of get our minds. Uh, in tune really on the fact of who God is uh, and, and He alone being God. So, as Pastor mentioned, today we're going to be looking at, at a cult called uh, Mormonism, or as they, I believe, prefer to be called now, uh, officially, uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And they would prefer that we refer to them, or their friends refer to them as Latter-day Saints, not as Mormons. I guess they've determined that to be uh, have a bad connotation, but uh, according to their website, they, they prefer that they be called Latter-day Saints. But we're going to uh, look into this poll a little bit today, and uh, I just want to preface it by saying I am not an expert in Mormonism, all right? So, uh, some of you may have studied deeply into it. Some of you may have even had one knock on your door at a specific time in your life and may have even uh, questioned or, or gone into it a little bit. 
So there can be a, a, a wide variety of those kinds of backgrounds in here or maybe tuning in. So I just want to preface by saying I am in no way an expert. So if you come up to me with like a question of a passage in, you know, Pearl of Great Price or something like that, don't expect me to know the answer, okay? I don't know uh, all the stories from the book of Nephi or Ether or any of those, all right? So uh, don't, don't think that I am an uh, a, uh, expert here. Just want to make sure that is clear. But I am uh, just wanting to share some of the basics of what they hold, uh, what they follow, kind of give you an idea. So when you're perhaps witnessing with someone, you already know what they're thinking, what they're believing, so that can help you address the true critical points that they need to know for salvation, right? And it's not about winning the, the uh, smarts battle, right? The battle of the minds. Oh yeah, well let me tell you what it really says and I'm going to win this argument and this debate by sharing this. Remember, that's not the point, right? We want to know these things. We want to know what they're believing. We can get to the truths that they need to know and believe and understand. Right? We want to get to those points in sharing the gospel with them. Because right now, as we as we looked at 2 Corinthians 11 last week, they are blinded, right? And and the well, actually, we looked at Satan as an angel of light, and now we have false teachers going about trying to deceive us, right? But in reality, they're blinded, and we need to share the truth with them so that they can understand and see the glorious light of the gospel of the true Jesus, right? So, first, I want to start off with a little bit of history, okay? A little bit of history of uh, Mormonism and some of the, the leaders. Now, we talked about last week, one thing about a cult is they have certain leader or leaders and the people follow those people or person intently, okay? And that is very true of Mormonism. There are very specific individuals that they will follow and they will say that they believe whatever they say and really if they question or go against what one of those authorities have said, they can really get excommunicated or banished or disciplined or whatever you want to uh, call it as, as punishment in, in different forms depending on, I guess, how they sin against that authority. Okay, So we're going to start when all of this kind of began with the first person, and I'm sure you guys know his name. What's his name? Smith. Joseph Smith. Good common name, Joseph Smith. Can't go wrong with those names, right? Uh, so Joseph Smith. It's actually Joseph Smith Jr., okay? Uh, his dad was Joseph Smith Sr. You got it, okay? So Joseph Smith Jr., and he was born in 1805 in Vermont. And when he was about 10 years old, he moved to New York State. His, his dad and family moved to Palmyra, New York, around 1815. Now, Joseph Smith was, was known or had experiences with what was called a seer stone. And he was really enamored with trying to find treasure, like buried treasure, and hoping to find the money, dig it up somewhere, and he would use seer stones to try to find it. Think, I, I guess you would think of like a seer stone. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure none of us have those in our pockets right now. But I, I think you would think of it maybe like a crystal ball, right? He's looking into this stone, looking for this stone to tell him what's in his heart and his mind. Kind of sounds a little like witchcraft to me, doesn't it? Yeah. Conjuring up some sort of leading, some sort of spiritual guidance to get what he wanted. Which was really some material wealth. He, 
him, his dad, his family, from my understanding, they are known for going around and, and digging and like excavating and trying to find this buried treasure. Now, can help us to, to kind of even apply thoughts like that to us, right? Here he is spending all of his time and energy looking for that treasure that number one fades away, but number two, he never even got it. He never dug once and found this great treasure that he was looking for. He was looking for something that was going to fade away. I wonder how many of us spend day after day after day digging and digging and working and trying and striving to achieve some treasure that really will in the end just corrupt and fade away. When instead, God says, lay up your treasure in heaven where moth or rust corrupts, right? That's where you want to lay your treasure. That's what you want to hide. And, and, and here Joseph Smith is spending his time looking into these seer stones trying to get some sort of vision on where some treasure's buried. All right? So that's a little background on the guy. I mean, it's not like he's a, you know, a clergyman or anything like that. It, that's his personality, right? That's, that's his characteristics. So he's out there doing such... So then he had his first vision. And this is all recorded in uh, uh, the Book of Mormon. There's, there's a book within that book, uh, I think called History. Or, or histories, I believe it's uh, just history though. And he's recording his history so all of us can go back and see what really happened, I guess, was his goal. And uh, he records this vision that took place in 1820. So different denominations around there uh, in his area in New York, and he was trying to find out which one was really the true one, right? He wanted to know which denomination was the right one. So he, he decided, and, and he even said, it was my first time, it was the first time in my life that I had made such an attempt for, amidst all my anxieties, I had never as yet made the attempt to pray vocally. So he decides, I'm looking for the right church. This is his first time ever like going out in the woods and praying and seeking God's guidance supposedly as, as to what he records for us. And he says, God, I need guidance on what church to pick, right? That's kind of humorous to me for a person who's never prayed before in his entire life, his first time praying, he's now asking, well, which church should I pick? And all of a sudden, he has a vision. He has a vision, and, it, and, and, and in the vision, he is told, actually, all of these churches, all these denominations are wrong. None of them are teaching the truth. None of them are following what's right. I, you know, here's, here's what's right, all right? So he then decides and says, I was shown the truth. Nobody else has it, but I was shown the truth. In 1823, so three years later, he has another vision. And now in this vision, he is told that there are some golden plates buried. That's interesting. He's been spending his life looking for treasure. It just so happens in this uh, vision, he is told about some golden plates, and then like a, uh, what, what's it called? Umen and, and Thumen there in uh, uh, the Torah. That, there's some like seer stones or whatever in there with the golden plates that he can use to translate the what's written on the golden plates, all right? So then he begins to translate what, what is found on these golden plates that happen to be kind of buried near his home, and he finds them, and he begins to translate them from 1827 to 1829. Now, could be totally wrong. I've been wrong many times. <laughs> For a person who has been digging and seeking for treasure for years in his life, even 
doing some like dark spiritual stuff to try to find it. If he were to really dig up plates made of gold, what, wouldn't you think he would have like just sold them and had the money and moved on with his life? I mean, maybe my logic is totally wrong. But imagine if you found plates made out of gold. I don't think we have the plates made out of gold. And on these plates of gold was written some sort of uh, different kind of Egyptian language that he was able to use the seer stones to interpret. And through this came a whole new world history that has never been proved and only exists in the Book of Mormon. Basically, some people came over to America, like after the Tower of Babel. That was one group. And then you had some Jewish people that came over in like 600 B.C. into America, right? And then these were like some old ancient peoples in, in America. There was a battle between them. Have any of you ever heard of that in all of your world history studies? No. No. But all of a sudden, this new vision and, and this stuff that he sees in the, on, the, on the golden plates that he's dug up and found is now recorded. Even his interpreting or reading of the golden plates is kind of kind of odd. It seems like something like he was in one side of the, like there was like a curtain, and he was over on one side and he was reading them with these seer stones or different uh, kinds of ways to read the golden plates, and then he was telling somebody on the other side of the curtain what, what they said. And it all went from this one man developing this story. One man. He's the one who had the vision. He's the one who's writing it or, or saying what needs to be written down. He's the only one that's seen it. He's the only one that's interpreting it. And he's telling everyone about it. This one single person. Now, we even have this morning, right? In, in the book of Matthew, the angel appearing to Joseph in the dream, telling him, to go down to Egypt, the angel appearing to Joseph, you need to go back home. But it's not Joseph giving us the account of that, right? It's somebody else altogether. Matthew is writing of what happened in an angel appearing to him. But here, Joseph Smith is making up the whole thing. He's the only one involved. He's the only one seeing or experiencing anything and recording it and, and giving it for people and his followers to follow, and, and you should never question. So in 1830, he finally finished uh, translating these golden tablets, these golden plates, and he published the Book of Mormon in 1830. All right? So... He leaves, uh, well, he was, I, I believe, in, in Pennsylvania at the time, uh, if I'm not mistaken, at, with his father-in-law. And so he had a little trouble. Joseph Smith had to, had to move around, right? To gain followers, he needed to move to different places. People, it says, uh, people knew him and his history around New York and Pennsylvania. There was a statement signed by 62 different residents of Palmyra, New York, that <laughs> stated, and they all they all signed off on it, that Joseph Smith Sr. and Joseph Smith Jr. were, quote, entirely destitute of moral character and addicted to vicious habits. Well, not going to get followers here, so I'm going to need to move, right? <laughs> so he moves to Ohio, and uh, then they go to Missouri, in Missouri, they, they, he buys, a, he buys a, 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 a piece of land. And, uh, you know, I, I do want to make a quote here uh, from Walter Martin. 
and, and, and it's good because it, it may say, well, David, you're you're saying all of this from a, a Baptist point of view, you know. Maybe you're just telling one side of the story. Maybe there were like 74 people in Palmyra that really liked it. Martin says, some may feel that it is unfair to quote only one side of the story. What about those who are favorable to the Mormons? In answer to this, the amazing fact is that there exists no contemporary pro-Mormon statements from reliable and informed sources who knew the Smith family and Joseph intimately. There are no sources, legitimate sources, that spoke well of the character of Joseph Smith. So it's not a one-sided story, it's just the story, right? You often hear there's her side, his side, and the truth, right? So in this case, there's only, there's only one side of the story that seems to be his character was not one that we would want to follow. So he moves to Missouri. There's all sorts of trouble in Missouri with uh, uh, people that didn't like the Mormons and so forth. There was, there was actually some, some things that took place there. Well, they end up moving to uh, Nauvoo, Illinois. And so now they're in this location and gathering a following, gathering a good following. And uh, they're growing. Well, it's in Illinois. There was a, uh, it's called the Navajo Expositor, which was an anti-Mormon publication. And it went out and it was going against the Mormons and uh, ended up, uh, Joseph Smith was put in prison. And while he was in prison, there was a mob they stormed the jail, and Joseph Smith was killed in 1844. So he, he didn't live very long, almost 40 years. But when he was killed, they had to kind of make him look good, so he was called a martyr. He was a martyr of that faith. So they had to keep it going. And one of the other men who was involved was, take a guess, Brigham Young. Brigham Young. Very good. So he ends up, for the most part, leading. There was a smaller faction that went down, and I believe they're still in Missouri today. They're called by a different name. But Brigham Young took over for the most part, and he now became leader. And so he led uh, the Mormon religion for about 30 years. Whatever these men have written or have said, their people are to follow. And they'll follow it wholeheartedly. They'll, they'll dedicate their lives to following what these men have said, even if they contradict themselves, even if it goes against the Bible, they will wholeheartedly live with whatever these other men have said. Guys, we have God's Word. We have a relationship with the God of Heaven. Should we not wholeheartedly follow Him? Should we not be so dedicated to the One who has redeemed us that we will be wholeheartedly devoted whatever he tells us and yet thousands thousands and thousands of people follow Mormonism practice Mormonism and go for it and they have tons of converts all the time and yet they are being led astray so as part of a cult they have a specific follower or, or, or a group of, or a, a specific leader or a group of leaders, and these are just a couple that we mentioned. And now they also follow like the new president or the new one in charge, and his words are are what we need to do, and they'll follow them. But also a cult, they have certain revelations or sources that they read and study. So the, there's four of them. 
the first one is the King James Version of the Bible. All right, so they, they use the Bible. It's number one. But don't, don't get too excited because they use three others. And uh, it, it all also depends on, on what you mean by the King James Version, like what, what that verse really means if it's interpreted properly, right? So uh, they have the King James Bible. They have another one called Doctrine and Covenants. They have another one called the Pearl of Great Price. And then, of course, the Book of Mormon. So they have four different sources of revelation. And those are their books that they use for doctrine. Okay? So they, as a cult, have added and done other uh, added other writings to their uh, repertoire of what they want to use to believe. So that's a little history on it, but I kind of want to look at a few things of what they believe. What do they really believe? I remember when I was a kid, right? I would see commercials on TV about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Hey, did you see it on TV? Hey, hey call us, we'll give you a Bible, the Book of Mormon. What is this? I have no clue what it is. A Bible and a Book of Mormon? Wow, what's the Book of Mormon? Go with the Bible? Right? Call us right now, we'll give it. Jesus, right? And Well, they're saying Jesus' name. That must be good, right? They talk about it. And they do. They say you should follow Jesus' example. It's really interesting. I was looking at their website. Talking about Jesus. Who is Jesus? He's Creator. Do you believe that? I believe Jesus is Creator. Jesus is Savior. Right? Yes. I believe that too. Jesus is Redeemer. I yes. believe that. He is our example. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yes. <laughs> That's not... They don't mean what you mean. And that's tricky. It's very tricky. Another spot. Now, see, you can you got to kind of look a little more. Do we believe in the Trinity? Yes, we believe in Father, uh, uh, Father, and, and the Son Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. But then it, it says something. But uh, I can't remember exactly how it says it. But it's. It's not what we believe about the Trinity, right? It kind of, it, it doesn't say, but it's not exactly what the Bible says. It doesn't say it like that. Um, but it, it says, oh, they're, they're different persons. And, and it, so it will say it on the website. Do we believe the Bible? Yes, we believe the Bible. But we also have these other books. So it's a little tricky. No, that's a lie. It's very tricky. It's very deceitful because they're using our words very much. And they would say, yes, you need to believe in Jesus Christ. <coughs> and we're thinking, that's what I say. I say you need to believe in Jesus Christ. And they're all going to say, I believe in Jesus Christ. Wow, well, I guess you're saying too, right? But they're not. They're not because it's another Jesus. Remember there in 2 Corinthians 11? They believe in another Jesus. I need some volunteers to read some Bible verses for us. J just some. Yeah, thanks. Pedro's one. <coughs> Let's see. Pedro, if you could read Isaiah 43, verses 10 to 11. I need uh, three, uh, two more people. <coughs> Fred, if you can read Isaiah 44, verse 6 and verse 8. Six eight. Miss Roseanne. Isaiah 45, verse 5, and then you're going to jump to 21 and 22. All right? So, uh, Pedro, you're at 43, 10 to 11. Fred, you're Isaiah 44, verse 6 and verse 8. And then Miss Roseanne, you're Isaiah 45, you're verse 5, 21 and 22. All right? Mr. Pedro, go ahead. Amen. I want to highlight something because we're going to get into some Mormon doctrines. Before me, there was no God formed. 
there was no God before God. Right? None. Even, neither shall there be after me. There's no God before me. There's not going to be any God after me. Jehovah is God. None before, none after. Right? Was that in the scripture? Did you see that for yourself? Or did you just take my word? Or hear it for yourself? Yeah. Or did you just take my word for it? It's in the Bible. Right? There's no God before me. No God after. And there's no God after me. That's important. Okay? All right. Uh, Mr. Fred, 44, yeah. verse 6, and then yeah. verse 8. Verse 6, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and besides me there is no God. Uh, 8, Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time, and have declared it? Ye are even my witness. Is there a God beside me? Yeah, there is no God. I know not any. Very good. There is no God besides me. There is no God. Uh, I, God even says, I don't know of any other gods. All right. Isaiah 45, verse 5. I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me. And then 21 to 22. Tell ye, and bring them near, yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient time? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I, the Lord? And there is no God else beside me, a just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God. There is none else. Now, not my word, but God's word. Based on God's word, <coughs> how many gods are there? One. One. God said, I am God. Are there any other gods? No. No. Are there any gods that ever existed before God? No. Are there ever going to be any other gods after God? No. Nope. No. That's what God has said. God Himself said that. He said, I am God and there is no other God besides me. The Mormon doctrine of God is polytheistic. There are multiple gods. In their teaching, the gods gathered together and, and conferred a council, and eventually Jehovah God became, he earned his status to be a god. Some of it I don't even want to explain because it's so blasphemous and so gross I, I don't even want to explain. But it is not biblical. There is no other God but Jehovah. There was no other God sitting around like Greek or Roman gods, right? That sounds like Greek and Roman mythology. A bunch of gods sitting around, hanging out. Deciding, well, let's, let's make this one. In, in control of planet Earth. He's earned his way to be a good God. <laughs> Does it, that doesn't match with the God of the Bible. He said, I'm God. There is no other God. I didn't earn some status of God from man to God. I have always been God. There was no other God before me. And guess what? You guys will never never earn the status of being God. You will be my children because I love you. But you will never be God. Was it not the problem of Satan? I'm going to attain to the height of God. Isn't that often the pride in man's heart? I'm God. I'll live for me. I'm awesome. 
I'm the greatest that has ever existed. There's no God after me. I am God. Yeah, Amos. Yeah, I wanted to say uh, <clears throat> that the Mormon religion is uh, attracted to it because uh, they can they can continue in certain sins. Like, don't they practice uh, many wives? Not many. You know, so they said, well, uh, hey, I like this religion. Yeah, Jesus is uh, my savior, but, but I can marry as uh, many wives as I want to, so they're attracted. So I think uh, people are attracted to certain cults because they, they allow certain sins. They do. And they would, uh, yeah, the polygamy thing was they allowed it, and then they said no, and that was to, so they could, you know, they were having issues becoming a state. Don't have any Coca um, coffee. You're right. They, they concentrate on, you know, and a lot of things that they would proclaim you would think make for good citizens, good neighbors, right? Be be nice to other people, take care of your bodies, uh, you know, you want joy and happiness. And you know what? There's actually a lot of people in the Mormon faith that are really high up in political powers. Romney. And You'd be amazed. I think we would all be amazed at the, the multitude that really are part of the Mormon faith. And you even mentioned, and, and I kind of skipped over or, or didn't go through that, but you know, it's interesting with Joseph Smith, he was always wanting riches. And he never, he never dug them up. But it started working out for him if he could get power and followers. And the power and money go together a lot. Yeah. Right? And so, I can't find the treasure, but now he's starting to make up a story. And if he starts getting followers, now he's getting power, and people are going to exalt him. And you know, if he's in power, he's going to be able to probably get money and stuff like that. So he gets it. He still gets to exalt himself. Right. I have a question. Did anybody ever see these gold tablets, supposedly? That's what I, just say? I don't think anyone else saw them, right? I, I could so, be wrong. You know, Does anyone you, you'd think else people know better would want, that he found them you, and somebody saw them? You'd think I people think would ever. want proof, you know? Well, <laughs> look, if, if you believe something, you can convince yourself and just say, well, you know, you can argue your way out of it. And it's really like how we justify us sinning sometimes, right? When we're tempted to sin, and God says, don't do that, and then what do we do? We kind of like, well, you know, I think it, you know, and sometimes we try to justify what we, what we did, and then it, it, it doesn't, it's not good. <laughs> yes? Yeah. <laughs> it's funny play on words there. Uh, interesting. Um, but yeah, and so he's very consumed with himself, right? Like if he wants, he you know, he's not very pleased with his wife, so he'd like to make sure he can have more. And well, you know, God gave me a vision that we can have more than one wife, right? So Solomon had. Yeah, Solomon did, and uh, it wasn't good. Uh, Look at what happened. He, he turned his heart from God because of it. So, uh, yeah, he was very focused on himself. So, the Mormon faith teaches them that there are multiple gods. And we are all, so, so we're like spirits. We have been, we have been uh, given birth up in, like, heaven as spirits. So we need to have bodies so we can come down and take on the body and live the the, the life experience. And really, Adam was created and he was had to sin so that we could live life. All these spiritual beings that are, have been created in heaven need a body to come down into. And so Jesus was brothers with Lucifer. Right? That's what they teach. Jesus and, and Lucifer were brothers and they needed some one of 
God needed one of them to come down. And Joseph being the old, uh, Jesus being the older brother, God chose him. And Lucifer got mad because Lucifer really wanted to do it. And so uh, that's why he's mad and, and fighting. But it was, it, he, God chose Jesus, this angel, to come, or this, this being to come. And he lived the perfect example. And we can follow and we can be like Jesus. We need to follow Jesus' example and his teachings and be like him. So we can be happy and have joy and live a good life. And then we can attain to that eternal life. And one day, we can also earn the privilege of being a God. And then one day, you can be a God of a different planet and start another race up because you have attained and earned your status as a God. Now, to those of us who have read the Bible, how blasphemous is that? But if you've never read the Bible, that doesn't sound too bad. I would love to be a God. <laughs> right? From a human standpoint, you're saying I get to be in control? You're saying I get to like be a creator? Right? So here's just some things that they have said or have that are, are written about God. In the beginning, the head of the gods called the council of the gods, and they came together and concocted a plan to create the world and people in it. God Himself, too. God Himself was once as we are now and is an exalted man. No way. By the way, number three, the Father has a body of flesh and bones as tangible as man's. The Son also, but the Holy Ghost has not a body of flesh and bones, but is a personage of spirit. Another one that's a big one, popular. As man is, God once was. As God is, man may become. That's the God they're teaching. That is not the God of the Bible. How, how different is that from what we were what we believe in when they would say, yeah, Jesus is creator, Jesus is savior, Jesus is redeemer. Wow, we're, we're thinking they're right in line. They're not in line at all. There's a plurality of gods out there. It's gross. I don't want to get into some of the stuff that they say because I just feel gross saying. And uh, I don't know. Are you going to say one of the gross things that I'm thinking of? Oh. It sounds like Scientology is I think there's some similarities, yeah. I yeah. like Scientology. And so, um, oh, I want to get to, to salvation. And blood. Yeah. You can ask me now. I really don't know a lot of stuff. So I understand how does this operate in the United States? Is it going to be not only is it illegal? There's no more. There's no more. I, I, I don't I don't know how they do it politically. It's, I don't know the answer. When they do it. There's breakout. There's breakout uh, things from Mormonism. Renegade Mormons who practice polygamy, and they had to move to Mexico. Right. You know, so they don't really practice. Yeah. So it. I w I would like to venture from that topic. All right. Let's. Uh, all I really prefer not to discuss it uh, that much. Uh, if, if we don't mind, so we can talk about some of the other things they believe. Because when you're witnessing on the street, let's not be like, hey, aren't you a polygamist? Right? That is not, that is not the best inroad. All right? So we want to we wanna concentrate on, hey, Jesus is God, right? Jesus died for your sin. And they're going to say, yeah, he did die for my sin. 
And you have to believe that. And you have to be baptized, and you have to go to the church, the Mormon church, and you have to start doing good works. Because the blood of Jesus can cleanse some of it, but you've got to work and make sure it's all cleansed. It, his blood isn't good enough to forgive all sins. And there's some sins that are so evil, you even have to shed your own blood and die for it. You can't be forgiven of that. That is in stark contrast to my Savior's blood. My Jesus' blood is mentioned in Hebrews chapter 9. And if you read Hebrews, and we've even gone through Hebrews, right? It's been a couple years. Uh, it's hard to believe that it's been that long. It doesn't seem that long ago when pastor preached through Hebrews. Jesus is better. Jesus is better. Jesus is better. Right? Yes. He is better than angels. He's not an angel. Both angels. He's not an angel. He's, He's better than. His priesthood is better better than from the Aaron uh, lineage and the Aaronic priesthood. His blood is better than the blood of animals, of bulls and goats. And in Hebrews chapter 9, uh, let's see, uh, verse 11, but Christ being come an high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle. Tabernacle not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. And it was neither by the blood of goats and of calves, but by His own blood. He entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. He entered into that temple made without hands, one time. One time. And the blood that He spilled was for us enough to give us eternal redemption. That is our hope. Yeah. It is eternal redemption in Jesus' blood. That's not what the Mormons would teach. You need to trust Jesus' grace to then empower you to do good enough works because you got to keep doing to have that eternal forgiveness. That's sad and an exhausting way to live with no sure hope. And that's these people. They might say they have hope, they have joy, they have a community, they have friends, they have big family. But they're missing out on the eternal security because to them, Jesus' blood is not enough. So, that's a little bit of the history and we, I know we just touched a little bit on there, on the small parts of their beliefs. I, I really don't want to talk about some of it. To me, it was kind of gross and I, I, didn't, I, I didn't feel comfortable sharing it. Uh, so we will take a few questions as long as it's not about polygamy. I was just reading on when you read Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit of offer offer himself without without spot to God, purge your confidence of dead works to serve the living God? That's right. right. The living God. That's right. He will his blood purges serve the living okay. God. Yeah. Yeah. It's, are there beliefs based upon things that are written or any, or, or are they based just on what their leader, uh, so-called leader says? Well, so it's, it's based Could on... Could they change just like that? Well... <laughs> Could so they change it from, you know, day to day or from... No, it's not going to change that much, but it is based off what was written either, either, like I said, the Bible or those other books. So if there have been a slight, you know, some revisions where it didn't, uh, it wasn't good. They've slightly uh, had to revise some of those things, right? Um, but they would follow those things which are written down. Those books, yeah. Yeah. So is there a ranking of books? Because there's obviously the clear scripture that says that Jesus was not created and that all things were created by him and for him. Do they, like, the 
Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not sure how they weigh in on that. But uh, I think if you were to say Jesus is creator, they would agree with you on that, which is the tricky part. But they believe he was created. Yeah. <laughs> they believe God was created too, so it's, it's really weird. It's kind of like he earned godhood who could then create or something like that. So I don't know how the... How it adds up. Yeah. So if they believe God was created, so how do they answer to uh, Genesis 1, chapter 1, verse 1? In the beginning, God, God created. created. Yeah, so I think that they kind of loop in together. So it's like God, God Father, that, that God, earned his right to be a God of earth. And so he could create earth, from my understanding, right? He is creator. He could make earth. Um, if, if I'm understanding what they say correctly, but maybe I'm off. Maybe, maybe, maybe the the council of gods decided. I'm not sure how they add that together, but it makes it seem like you can earn your way to be a god, to be in charge of other planets. So maybe you can earn your way to be creator. No, I'm not sure. I just wanted to read from uh, Romans 11. It says, For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, or who has first uh, given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again. For of him, and through him, and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. Yeah. I think uh, they are concept of God in direct opposition with what the yeah. Bible teaches. God has no counsel. That's right. And I want to... So they must believe in other civilizations, right? Because if you could be a god of another planet, you could be uh, you could uh, be a god, oh, you know, you know civilization. Mm. So they must be believe in other other forms of being and stuff something, like right? that. If you if you take that sense. to a conclusion. But I I do want to point out if you speak to a Mormon, <laughs> they know the King James Bible. They have stuff memorized. So don't think you're going to throw out a verse necessarily and be like, ha, I'm using Bible. Because they can very quickly throw Bible back. It's a shame, isn't it? They stop the whole. People. They don't understand the whole thing. They don't. But it's a shame of how much more they have memorized than people who accept the Bible for what it truly means. They have it down. And a lot of times Bible-believing Christians are speaking with them and they're going to recite a verse and a Bible-believing Christian will be like, yeah, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know that one, right? We need to know our Word, God's Word. Brings us back. We talked about that last week. Knowing God's Word. <coughs> Any other questions or thoughts? And I'm sorry if I didn't answer the questions. Okay. Well enough. Where did they get the name Mormon? Oh, it's it's one of the. It was a son of uh, Mormon. Was let's see, who appeared to him? Morani, right? Uh, oh, where'd she go? Morani appeared to him. Mormon was either Morani's son or he was Nephi's son. He was somebody's son. Do you remember, <laughs> David? And Mormon was his son, though, right? There was somebody named Mormon, and in the Book of Mormon, there's somebody named Mormon through some of that history that's made up, or the visions. Mormon. Uh, huh? No. <laughs> Not that. Uh, but he was somebody's kid. I don't remember. Or whatever. Okay, yeah. So when they go around trying to make converts, is that part of their earning? Yeah, that's part of the thing they need to do. That evangelize. They need to do earn. Yeah. So wouldn't if you had to earn your salvation and your eternal life, wouldn't you go out ded and dedicate yourself to get converts? Because I need to get to eternal, uh, I need to get eternal life and and better myself. So I need to get out there, right? That's going to motivate you to go, so you can have it. So they're right? not interested in you particularly. That makes sense. They're interested in themselves and how I could become a god someday. Right. And, have it, you know. and whereas ours is reversed, uh, yeah, right? Exactly. We're we reversed. often 
we often care so much about ourselves that we don't, right? We don't go out and share the gospel. But sharing the gospel really should be motivated for that person. I love that person enough that I will tell him. I will tell him. Yeah, that's a good question. I think, so I think um, a couple of things. Number number one, like we talked about last week, it's, it's building a relationship and showing love to a person in a way because they're already turned off to somebody who doesn't believe Mormonism, right? They could already have a bad like view of, oh, they don't believe my truth. Um, or they could just be like, I'd be a good neighbor to that person. It's showing love and building a close relationship with them. And then it's just asking the Lord, what should I share with them? And then just when you share, you just trust that God would use it in their hearts, right? And there might be times where the conversation kind of ends and, and you don't feel like you've gotten anywhere. But then you never know what they're thinking about later, right? Maybe God starts using that and they start saying, well, that, hmm, I don't, that doesn't add up, right? So I think it's just the standard, typical response. Love them. <clears throat> and just speak God's truth with them. Right. Yeah, you have more to say. <laughs> what about those ones that we just meant for one if we want to share with them? Right, yes, yeah. specific. That's, I, 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 don't, I don't know necessarily, like, how do you keep from arguing, but, yeah. <laughs> That will be our last question. I was going to. All right. This is.